My text today would be from verse 1 to 19, but I don't want to uh, read the whole passage right now, so let me read Luke 20, verse uh, 16 to 19 especially verse 16, half one word. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crossed. In some other translation, will become a dust. The teachers of the law and the chief priest looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. So it is in this context of a parable Jesus has spoken, and I want to share with you, either be broken or be smashed. That is the conclusion that comes out of this parable. Either you be broken and find some other identity or be crossed, become a dust and disappear. And in the context of this parable we have to see in verse 1 and 2 you see the leaders of the Jewish community come to Jesus and they ask him about his authority. And last week we saw how Jesus entered the temple and chased away those who were buying and selling. And he condemned these people, especially the religious community, as the, the thieves or the robbers or the corrupted people. So he entered Jerusalem with this amazing crowd announcing him as the coming king, Hosanna, Hosanna, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. In a prophetic way, they welcome Jesus into Jerusalem as a king. And in other Gospels, you, you read, the leaders commanded Jesus to silence these people, and Jesus told them that if they keep silent, the stones will cry out. And in that context, he goes into the temple, drives them out of the temple, and then he condemns the Jewish leadership. Absolutely, utterly, he condemns. And this was unthinkable, unbearable for these religious leaders. And therefore, they had to ask him, what authority do you have? Who are you? Who do you think you are? What authority do you have to condemn us? And what authority do you have to challenge the establishment of the religious community? Or you even accused us being robbers or thieves or corrupt people. Who gave you that authority? Now you have to look into the context of the political power at that time. Who gives authority was very important. For example, the Jewish kingdom at that time was in his existence because of the Roman authority given to Herod. Rome gave him the authority to become the king. And then, at this time, Herod's kingdom was divided into several pieces. And three pieces were still functioning. Three sons of Herod were ruling. And each of them had to be given authority by the Roman rulers. And even then, the, the, the Herod that was ruling Jerusalem was chased out of authority, out of power by Rome. And now they were uh, ruled by a Roman governor. So the authority was given and they are thinking in terms of this kind of hand, uh, transfer of authority from high to the law. So who gave you this authority? And that is one kind of authority. And that the second kind of authority they were having in mind was the Torah, or the law. The law of Moses says this. Our law says this. Our law gives us the authority to do this or not to do that. So they looked at Jesus and they were wondering 
what kind of authority he is going to appeal. If he says, I have authority from Rome, then we can put him in a difficulty again. We can say he is a traitor. He is trying to establish his own kingdom. And then, but if he says, my authority comes from God, or my authority comes from law, then they could tell that he is blaspheming God. They could accuse him of tra treachery or of blasphemy. So with that, they ask him, who gave you this authority? What authority do you have? And then from verse 3 onward until the last verse we read today in 19, Jesus replies to these Jewish leaders. And uh, in his reply to their asking question about his authority, he uses first John the Baptist, second he tells them the parable, and third he gives them the warning with the rejection of the capstone. The John the Baptist, the parable of the tenants, and this cornerstone in reply. So the first, when he talks about John the Baptist, now you have to always see Jesus knows human inclination. He knows what was in their heart. Knowing that they were not asking a sincere question, that the reason for them to ask Jesus what authority he has was to trap him. And so as always, as often, he will also ask them back. He, he answers the question by asking another question. That is an ancient Greek rhetoric that often time you don't answer the question, you question the questioner so that they really get to understand where they are standing. Sometimes you have seen in your own teaching career that some students ask you foolish questions. Some ask questions that will make you look foolish and they wanted to trap him at this time. And Jesus asked us a counter question and he said, what do you think about John the Baptist? Who do you say John the Baptist was? Or where did he come from? Was he sent by God? Or did he himself come up with his idea? Now John the Baptist, when Jesus says, from where was his baptism? He's talking about the entirety of the, the, the ministry of the Baptist, John the Baptist. How he was uh, proclaimed by the angel before he was conceived. How his parents in their old age obeyed the message God gave to them and the mother gave birth, how he went out into the wilderness, how he came back preaching the repentance from their sins, how the whole Jewish community listened to him and they went to the river Jordan and were baptized. It was as if the Jewish community was now coming to the faith in the Judaism for the first time. The baptism was practiced for the heathens actually, not the Jews at that time. If the non Jewish people wanted to come into the kingdom of God, they would take baptism. John, demanding them to be baptized, is asking them, you have forgotten God. And he baptizes them. And there comes along the way Jesus Christ. And he looks at Jesus and says, look the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. He is the one who will ultimately baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He is the one who will take away your sins. I only baptize you as a symbolic uh, baptism of the coming Messiah. He is the one. And then people began to follow Jesus. And along there, the Jewish leader had come in Gospel of Luke chapter 7. They had rejected John the Baptist. They refused to take baptism from John because he was condemning them. And they were the religious people. They do not want to be condemned. They want to say, we are smart enough. We are spiritual enough. We are powerful enough. The whole vicinity from Jerusalem is going to the Jordan River and being baptized by John. The leaders had rejected him. They refused to accept him from God. And now Jesus is putting this question before them one more time. He said, what do you think about John the Baptist? And they were in a great dilemma. 
if we say John the Baptist was from God, then we have to accept that Jesus also has authority from God. Their answer is given there. If we say John the Baptist is from God, then the authority that Jesus has is from God. But if we say John the Baptist was not from God, they believed he was not from God. They knew, they accepted, they rejected him as messenger, as a prophet. But because the whole population accepted him as a prophet, they knew they would be killed if they denounce John the Baptist. You can imagine the crowd is really rallying behind Jesus Christ. The crowd is on fire for Christ right now. The moment Jesus makes one statement about his kingship, they would put him on the throne. So much so, if the Jewish leadership denounces John the Baptist, they would stone him. So they were afraid. And the best answer these highly intellectual Jews could give was, we don't know. You know, in those days, that these religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, they would have a special cap that would designate under whose authority you belong, whether Simeon's authority or Hillel's authority or some other Rabbi's authority. So everyone had a school where you are graduated. You are from Seoul National University. I'm sorry those of you who are graduated from there. But I have met several friends who graduated from Seoul National University. They have a different cap. They have a different feeling. Even some of the Christian friends I have said, I'm from Seoul National University. Or if not from Korea National University, if not from Kaist. And if I'm from Thaizen University, I don't want to tell where I'm graduated from. That was the case. And Jesus demanded them an answer and they, in, in front of this crowd, with a long face, with a shameful face, they said, we don't know. And Jesus denounces them, said, I will not tell you where I come from. Because you rejected me, you rejected John the Baptist, you rejected the grace of God in your life and therefore, I will not answer you, but I'm going to give you a parable. So the next is the parable, the parable of the tenant. This is the last parable we will see in the Gospel of Luke. And if you have read the parable, I don't want to go into it detail, but the, the story is, there was a man who planted a vineyard. It's a story of how Isaiah talks about God choosing Israel, putting a fence around it, cultivating, beautifully planting, doing everything that was needed for this garden to produce fruit. And Jesus said, there was a man who planted a garden and then he rented this garden to some tenants and went away for a long period of time. When he came back, when the harvest time was there, he wanted some produce out of the garden from the tenants. He wanted what he uh, supposed to get from them. He sends his servant First servant, they beat him and send him empty-handed. Second servant, they beat him and beat him so shamefully they insulted him, send him empty-handed. Third servant, they beat him, they wounded him and sent him empty-handed. By this time, the owner was confused and he thought, oh, maybe they didn't respect my servants, so I will send my son. And the man sent the son and they killed him. By this time, the Jewish authority is getting what Jesus was trying to tell them. God had chosen Israel, had sent many, many prophetic messengers. Some they killed, some they insulted, some they wounded, some they put in prison like John the Baptist. And finally, God sent his son and they killed him. And the verdict finally is that he answers them with John the Baptist and he answered them with this parable that you are the tenants. Israel as a nation was the vineyard. 
God was the man who planted it. But you refused, you rejected the honor of the vineyard. The Lord of the vineyard, you rejected, you rebelled against him. You decided to live by your own rules and regulations and you rejected him. And then he asks them another question and say, what do you think when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the tenants? And that's a no-brainer, right? When the, you, you beat up his servants, you kill his son, and then he comes and demands a reply, what will he do to them? And Jesus makes it very clear that he will kill them and take away the vineyard and give it away. And in that comes the warning of the capstone. And that is where Jesus quotes from the Old Testament. This has been in several places how the builders rejected and ultimately that stone becomes the capstone or the cornerstone. And the function of that cornerstone, Jesus elaborates that and he says, Anyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But on anyone who, whom this stone falls, it'll grind him, make him a dust and it'll just fly away. It's a serious warning. But sometimes this parable is, it looks as if Jesus is entirely talking to the Jewish community here and we may have no relevance to it. But I think this is the story of all of us who have rejected the call of Christ. All of us who have rejected Christ as our Lord and our Savior, our ultimate destiny is either we will be broken people and reframed into the image of God or we will be crossed and destroyed. And it is a very sad parable. It is not a good message to preach from. It is a sad thing that one day you and I will stand in such a crossroad and if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we will be given a future, a destiny that is different. But if we have rejected Christ the way this uh, tenants have rejected the way this Jewish leadership have, has rejected we will face the wrath of God the grace of God is amazing the grace of God we always sing about it and we we enjoy in thinking about God is a gracious God but Jesus had never sighed away that God is also a God of justice and judgment is there. No matter how much we deny Him in this life, we will face the day when the capstone will fall on us, when the wrath of God will come upon us. The crowd is listening to Jesus. The crowd longs to hear the words of Christ. Crowd is waiting for Jesus to make the final pronouncement saying that I am the Messiah. I am your hope. I am your way. I am your life. I am here to give you hope and destiny. But the Jewish leadership is willing to looking for chances to catch him up and then kill him and destroy him. And Jesus had given that predicament by this parable. Either, therefore, as you have rejected me, as, as, as I will become that cornerstone, I will become the king, I will become the ruler, I will claim the ownership of my vineyard. I will claim that I am the Lord and I will take care of the tenants who have rejected me. Now, the smashing of the Jewish nation took terribly. Of course, it has taken so many times, but the worst blow came in AD 70 when the Romans 
finally destroyed Jerusalem and scattered the Jews out of uh, Palestine. Uh, in fact, they changed the name itself, Palestine, after that. Uh, they don't want it to be known as Judea. No more Jews anymore. No more Jerusalem, no more Judea. Palestine. The temple was utterly destroyed. The city was utterly destroyed. So many Jews were killed. And for a thousand years, no Jew was allowed to come back to Palestine. For some time, there was a Christian kingdom in Jerusalem. And when Muhammad came to power, he destroyed the Christian kingdom as well and brought it under Islamic domination. During the Middle Ages, later in the 12th or 13th century, the Roman Catholic Church tried to redeem Palestine from the Muslim invasions, and that is known the periods of crusades, as you have heard, some of the stupid battles of Christianity for which we are still blamed. Even though the, the Roman Catholics were provoked to do those things, but the way they did was so, so horrible, so foolish. Even Roman Catholic Church couldn't rescue Jew for Jerusalem. And even today, finally, in 1948, they have got the land, but they cannot live peacefully there. Until there is a temple, the Jews will not think they have a kingdom there. They have a country now, some of the Jews, but unless they have a temple, the true fulfillment of their inheritance as a promised land will never be realized. And that is what we are witnessing these days, the struggle to build the temple. And we don't know how long that will last, whether we will see a literal temple there, whether Jesus Christ will come back. It is time for us to think. The Jewish nation was smashed to the ground. The Jews were scattered. And the vineyard was not given to the Rome. The vineyard was given to the Gentiles. To you and to me. The, the vineyard is given to the Lord. The master took back the vineyard. He took the ownership of the vineyard. No more renting. No more hiring anymore. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the vineyard. He is the king and his kingdom has come. Amen. He said, my kingdom has come. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And to, to the Jews he said, if I cast out the evil spirit by the finger of God, know that the kingdom of God has come in the midst of you. So the vineyard is now belonging to the master. And you and I are the fruit of the vineyard. And we are now in this vineyard of God. So my brothers and sisters, what I wanted to share with you is now this parable is also applicable to the church. Throughout the history we have seen how church has taken the place of the Jewish leadership. Many a times the church has killed so many servants of God who wanted to translate this Bible into their vernacular languages. So many times the church has killed those who wanted to worship God free from human traditions. And even today, the church in various forms takes this, the nature of the religious spirit and does not allow the Lord to receive the fruit from the vineyard. And Jesus renounces such kind of religious leadership, uh, a spiritual leadership that is so full of hypocrisy. And they do not give the Lord the glory, but they receive glory to themselves. <coughs> Servanthood, service, uh, sacrifice, gospel preaching, missions, all have been becoming a means to establish human kingdoms and human authorities and human institutions and human organizations just like Jews had done. God is not present in those magnificent buildings and organizations. Religious leaders are present. So by denouncing Jewish leaders, Jesus is denouncing all religious authority because it is the religious spirit that rejects Jesus Christ all the time. Either it is a Hindu religious spirit or Islamic or Buddhist or even uh, 
Christianity. The Lord of the harvest stands looking for fruit. And Jesus Christ, when you reject, he becomes the cornerstone again. Ultimately, ultimately we will have to stand before him. Either we will worship him, bow and on our face uh, before him and fall on our faces, or we will stand there in terror by looking at this cornerstone falling on us. The wrath of God will be poured out. It is a sad day. Just for a brief moment, I want to take your attention to the brokenness of Christian community. When Jesus said, anyone who falls on this stone will either be broken or, or, or the, anyone on whom the stone falls will be crossed, either be broken or be crossed. It could be translated in either way, uh, it could be interpreted in either way. Jesus may be saying the same thing by two kind of uh, contrasting things here. Or maybe Jesus has in his mind two different distinct uh, propositions. And the traditional way of understanding is that when he says anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, generally Bible scholars and the pastors would like to see that if you fall on Jesus, that means you accept your sinfulness, you are a broken human being, recognizing how fallen you are. You come to Christ and you yield to him. You become a broken human being. You say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. I have rejected you. I have rejected your laws. Now I come before you. Have mercy on me. We fall on him and we become broken people. And by his own grace and his mercy, he recreates us in Christ to become the living stone. When we fall on him as broken people, recognizing our sinfulness, we become pieces or the stones that built the living temple. Amen. That we see, let me read again from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 to 22. Here it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, we fall on him. We are broken people. And he is the chief cornerstone. Even though we are broken, the artist has a way of fixing us into this living building. And because the cornerstone is there, all our brokenness are covered. And the wall is built beautifully. So Paul says in Ephesians, he is the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined. You know, I don't know whether you have looked very carefully how the, these uh, stonemason built houses. If you have not seen, go and see. They will have to break every single stone they pick up. If they don't break, it wouldn't fit. So this is how the master builder is. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together. Those of us who have fallen on Christ, those of us who have accepted him as our Lord and our Savior, we are being built together. You may not feel like it sometimes. You may, you may feel that Jesus may throw you out of the sight you are good for nothing. No. The reason he may throw you out of sight is also to break you some, somewhere. To get you back into the right place. So Paul says, in him we are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Jesus went to the temple. What did he find? He found it to be the den of robbers. When he comes to this church, what would he find? When you come into some other churches, what do you find? 
let us thank God that he is breaking us in creating a building in which the spirit of the living God dwells. So last week I told you, if you're looking for the best church, if you find, don't join it. But if you find a dead church, go there and bring the living spirit of God to bring life to that church. And we are, those who fall on Jesus Christ will be building, will be built together. Let me also read the same thing goes in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 to 8. As you come to him, the living stone, look at here, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. In today's world, there cannot be unity in many areas of life, but there can be unity in one area. And that is, if you reject Christ, many people will be united with you. If you say, Christ is wrong, church is wrong, Christianity is wrong, everybody in the world who rejects will come around you. If you say, Buddha is the only way to heaven, nobody will say yes. If you say, Buddha is wrong also, nobody will say yes. But if you say, Jesus is wrong, everybody finds some kind of connection. They enjoy in rejecting Christ because it is the religious spirit in the world. And ultimately, in the last day, it will be able to unite the rest of those who reject Christ. So here, rejected by men, but precious to God. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and a precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, it's a very fearful thing. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So Jesus is asking these Jewish leaders to consider their actions and say, I give you a warning that the stone you're rejecting, the king that you're rejecting, the owner of the vineyard that you're opposing, has a day of vengeance will come to you and you'll have to face the wrath. I wish gospel was so sweet always. No, gospel is also very dangerous. The wrath of God is so dangerous, so real, and so merciless once you reject His mercy. And oftentimes we Christians have a trouble in distinguishing the wrath of God and the chastisement of God. You and I, those who have fallen on Christ, you and I who have allowed God to break our life, we will not face this wrath. You will not have to pay for your sin if you have allowed Christ to break your life, if you yielded your life. Because the power of the cross is such that he has taken away our sins. The moment you accept the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, the moment you lift your hand and confess your sins and say, Lord Jesus, here I come, he takes away your sins once and for all. You may not feel like it, but the truth is that your sins have been washed away. Amen. And you and I will not face this wrath to destruction. You and I will not be smashed. We will be broken many times over. Yes, you may see brokenness in your family if you don't repent from your sins, your practical sins. If you deliberately, continuously live in practical sins, you may see many more destruction coming into this life. But I believe by the grace and the mercy of God, so long as you fall on Him, you will not be smashed to destruction. 
He will bring His glory in such a way that you will Oh God, I could not understand the power of the cross. I hear I stand in the portals of glory. And how Lord, how, how could you save a sinner like me? You will give glory to God even in heaven. So it's better we begin here. Don't condemn yourself and don't wait for the day to be perfect to glorify God. Glorify God in your brokenness. Glorify the Son of the living God in your sinfulness. And repent from them. And come to Him. Say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. But those of us who reject the mercy of God, who refuse to fall and, uh, at the feet of Christ, uh, who refuse to be broken by the power of the Spirit of God, and who denounce Jesus as our Lord and as Savior, then we will stand at that judgment seat of God, and the wrath of God will be poured out on us, as the book of Revelation graphically portrays. And that is going to be a fearful day. And what is our responsibility? Can we keep silent? Can we say, I'm saved and praise God somehow my, by the mercy of God, I'm, I'm on my way to heaven.